And welcome to the Rob Call Bottom Up Show, available on Pacifica Radio and iTunes and Stitcher and SoundCloud and YouTube. And if you want to get all of the past archives, go to opinnews.com slash podcasts. I'm really excited to have an old friend uh, and a really funny guy on the show today. Steve Behrman, also known as Swami Beyond Ananda, is an internationally known author, humorist, and workshop leader. For the past 23 years, he's written and performed as Swami Beyond Ananda, the cosmic comic. And his comedy has been called irreverently uplifting and has been described both as comedy disguised as wisdom and wisdom disguised as comedy. As a Swami, Steve is the author of Driving Your Own Karma, When You See a Sacred Cow, Milk It for All It's Worth, Duck Soup for the Soul, and Swami Precedent, a seven-step plan to heal the body politic and cure electile dysfunction. In his past life, before he was Swami, Steve started an alternative high school in Washington, D.C., and co-authored a book about his experiences, No Particular Place to Go, Making of a Free High School. A political science major, he later taught history to auto workers at Wayne State University in Detroit as part of the Weekend College. Since 2005, Steve has written a political blog with a spiritual perspective, Notes from the Trail, hailed as an encouraging voice in the bewilderedness. His latest book, written with cellular biologist Bruce Lipton, PhD, is Spontaneous Evolution, Our Our Positive Future and a Way to Get There from Here. He can be found online at wakeuplaughing.com. Wow, that's a long bio. Great to have you. It is. I I thank you for, for putting up with it. I would have sent you a shorter one if I had more time. Yeah, Mark Twain. Yeah, I I cite him all the time. (laughs) So Great to have you here. Uh, we met back when I was running conferences on the brain and positive psychology and story, and you were an entertainer at, uh, back then for us. And uh, it's been good to get to know you and get to be friends with you and your wife, Trudy. And uh, I, I think this is going to be a real treat for the listeners and the viewers today. Uh, your, 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 what you do with words and ideas is truly unique and wonderful. So you... You, you told me that you're focusing on weaving t- together both humor and political evolution. What, what is that about? Well, first of all, my, my background, just to give you a little bit more, even though you said a lot in there, my, my background is originally political science. Although I have to confess, I never actually got so deep into the field that I actually dissected a politician. I never really got quite Ooh. to that level. Ooh, I like never, that. <laughs> never made it to that. Um, but I've always... But had wait, 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 wait. Let's, let's just go with that a second. What, what do you think you would find if you dissected a politician? Well, you know, I think probably um, not that much heart and not that much guts. Uh, and I think that that's partly due to the system that we have allowed to take over, which we can talk more about later. Uh, but I wanted to say that my work with Bruce Lipton uh, in writing this book, Spontaneous Evolution, was a continuation of my interest in uh, how humans relate collectively. And, uh, and as I began to study with Bruce and hear him and uh, understand better the process of evolution, I went, oh my goodness, it's very much like, uh, like comedy because um, in evolution, uh, often something surprising emerges from the bottom up without re- us really recognizing what that's going to be. It's something that is in relation to the larger, uh, the larger ecosystem or environment, but it always arises from uh, uh, population and the cells and so on, uh, the connection between the cells and something new happening. Humor is a lot like that in the sense that it's a way of taking familiar ideas and relating them in an unfamiliar way. And one of the problems that we're facing right now in trying to um, create this evolutionary upwising, as we call it, because we wake up and we wise up. One of the problems is that we're, we've been for thousands of years stuck in this dueling duality of it's this or it's that. Um, and humor liberates us from the duality because it often gives us a third way, as an example. Why is it that jokes happen in threes? 
a minister, a priest, and a rabbi. Why is that? Minister, priest, and a rabbi are discussing legacy. How do they want to be remembered? What do they want the eulogists to be saying when they're in their casket? And the minister says, well, I want them to be saying he was a family man and a pillar of his community. The priest said, I want them to be saying he was a holy man and a leader of his flock. The rabbi says, I want them to be saying, look, I think he's breathing. <laughs> So what happens is uh, humor takes us away from the ordinary. I mean, uh, number one sets up the premise. In this case, it's the minister. Number two reinforces the premise. In this case, it's the priest. And number three upsets the premise and offers a surprising third way, in this case, the rabbi. And we laugh because we're surprised and delighted. So what needs to happen right now, is certainly we're looking at the, at the tremendous polarization that we're experiencing in this country. And um, the evolutionary trick will be using that polarization as a dynamic duo, as a dynamo, to bring the energy from both sides together and have something else spiral up and emerge that we haven't seen yet. So as I see that humor is a way of disrupting the ordinary, we need to have the ordinary ways of disrupt. Uh, ordinary ways disrupted right now because we are entrenched in a certain way of being. And as we look at the new word global situation, uh, we recognize that we can't continue in the way that we've been. Uh, and so something needs to disrupt that. Good new word. <laughs> Everybody sure. knows what it means for some reason. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So you, and you play, you play with words a lot. Is, do you have a strategy to doing that or? You know, at an early age, I started seeing funny and hearing funny. And I, I'll, I remember the, uh, the first event that we did together in, in Palm Springs was called the Winter Brain Meeting. And uh, I was the speaker at the banquet. Right. And uh, after the banquet, uh, after the food part, I'm outside waiting to go in and be introduced. And I look at the placard in front of the room. And usually at these hotels, it usually says what the event is and so on. And it said, winter brain dinner. And for some reason, Trudy and I thought that was funny. And so I come in as the Swami and I go, you know, I really enjoyed the winter brain dinner, although it tasted a lot like chicken. Although I do feel smarter. So when you get, you know, I've had my 10,000 hours in um, hearing funny and seeing funny. And so... Uh, I've often been able to find a way of seeing something that involves a different interpretation. I'll give you an example. We were just, um, uh, right after we saw you in, in Princeton, we went to um, uh, see family in Maryland, and we went out with my brother and sister-in-law for dinner. We come back, we're staying with my cousins, and my cousin asks, what you have for dinner? And Trudy says, duck. We had duck. And my cousin asked, in all innocence, how did they prepare the duck? And Trudy and I look at each other. We both said, you know, you can't really prepare a duck for something like that. <laughs> and it's a testimony to Trudy hanging around me for 33 and a third years that um, she has been able to cultivate her own way of, of seeing funny and hearing funny. And I think that's, it is a habit that we can learn. So 33 and a third years, is there an LP record joke in there somewhere? Exactly. We're calling it our vinyl anniversary, <laughs> uh, indicating that we are long playing. All right. So keep going with evolution. I, tell me more about how comedy is like evolution and, and, and where you see the ties. Well, first of all, right now we are in, a, we're, uh, in the current world condition. Uh, you know, Bruce, my, my writing partner in this book, says that crisis precipitates evolution. And if we look at the crises that we seem to be immersed in, uh, the chances of precipitation are about 100%. And in, in looking at, at that, where we are right now, um, we need a third way. We cannot, it's not gonna be the conservatives dominating the progressives or the progressives dominating the conservatives. What's really required is something that's integral that's integrated and allows us to take 
the best of both sides. So if we, if we were really functional and sane, we would ask, how do we want to progress and what do we want to conserve? And those are the two functional um, flavors uh, of those particular, particular viewpoints. But because we've been programmed by fear, reinforced by fear, we've lived under the rule of the lowest common dominator for 5,000 years, we have come to recognize that uh, no matter what we say, no matter how idealistic we may seem, in our internal DNA, we're still stuck with dominator be dominated, okay, win so, lose. So stuck with a dominator for 5,000 years, that's a play on denominator. And yes, the lowest to... common dominator. We've had, we've had that. We're and civilization, a... but it's also a comment on civilization, right? Yeah, through, through our so-called civilization. And, uh, and so in this particular way of being, uh, we've had this ideal that's been uh, presented to us by our spiritual teachers, Buddha, Jesus, on and on and on, saying that really we're all in this together. We're all in this together. And now, as Bruce and I show in Spontaneous Evolution, modern science is showing that that's exactly the case. It's not survival of the fittest, it's thrival of the fittingest. Those that fit into the ecosystem uh, are going to continue to thrive as part of that ecosystem. So because of our beliefs and because of toxic patriarchy, both through traditional religion and through scientific materialism, we have just about woven ourselves outside the web of life. And an, uh, uh, and an intervention is what's required. And the intervention has to come from something that's above and beyond the two dueling dualities. And every time we use humor to shine a light on, uh, on the darkness, every time we use humor to point us, even playfully, in the direction of a third way, we pave the way for evolution because evolution is about a third way. Evolution is about uh, uh, include and transcend. It's yes and, yes and, yes and. And having the cosmic comic consciousness and having the comedic mind cultivating that allows us to take the exagger the, the um, insanity, the insanity of our civilization and through exaggeration and playfulness, bring it to awareness. And the Swami calls this pumping ironies because we suffer from irony deficiency. Seeing a doctor won't help, but seeing a paradox will. So every time we point people in the direction of paradox, we break down this reality that says it's either this or it's that. I'll give you one more story. This it really happened about 25 years ago. I'm doing a presentation at a health conference and I'm talking about irony deficiency and I point out a contradiction. Um, people who believe in, uh, who call themselves pro-life, but who favor the death penalty. I thought that that was a bit ironic. Afterward, a woman comes up to me and she's very angry because clearly she's anti-abortion. I made fun of her position. She was upset with me. I tell her a story, but she doesn't know I'm telling her a story. And I talk about a TV program that I saw where three religious leaders, once again, a minister, a priest, and a rabbi, are discussing the issue of when life begins. And uh, the priest went first. He said, life begins at conception. The woman shakes her head. Yes, that's what I believe. She doesn't know I'm telling her a joke. The minister said, life, believe, life begins when the baby emerges. And she's shaking her head no. And then the moderator said, Rabbi, when does life begin? Rabbi says, life begins when the children leave home and the dog dies. <laughs> In spite of herself, the woman burst out laughing and she hugged me. So this is an indicator that not only does laughter free the mind, but it also heals the heart. It frees the mind of rigid ways of thinking, and it puts us, it takes us from the dueling dualities of the head, from the static of the head to the ecstatic of the heart, to that coherent place where we have, where we know what love and coherence feels like. You know, I'll just mention, uh, back when I, I ran the, my positive psychology and optimal functioning conference, which you spoke at, uh, I would talk about the need to pump smile iron. 
about <laughs> how people have to build their smile reflexes. And there are all these different muscles that are part of a smile, starting with the ones on your face and the, your belly laugh. And from kids, I've learned you know, they wiggle their butt when they smile. They, they move their arms like this. Uh, I play racquetball with a buddy, and he goes like that when he gets a yeah. good point. I mean, there are so many ways to smile. And uh, we need to really enable all that to happen in, 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 in extra ways. You know, Montauk Chia talks about the inner smile, cultivating the inner smile that begins in the belly. That's part of a, of a Qigong practice. And the Swami, Swami Bhyandananda, talks about the levitational pull, which is this. And once you do that, as you know, as you said, um, when you do that, your body thinks you're happy. And you actually change the body chemistry, the hormones that you're secreting, simply by even this. Okay, so, so you're, we're on video now, but for those who are listening, what you did with that levitational pull was push up the corners of your mouth to produce a smile. Yes, exactly. Uplift the corners of your mouth. And, you know, often people approach the Swami and ask, ask the question, Swami, how can I uplift the world? How can I uplift humanity? And their faces are downlifted down in a, a frown. And I say, begin by uplifting your face because it will change your energy and it will change what you're broadcasting out there and it'll change the energy of the people around you. It seems like a very silly thing. It seems trivial. But nonetheless, uh, if you try it, you will begin to see that um, your life will be more above the line. It's, and it's and uh, when I was really getting in, I was giving workshops at national conferences uh, that people, no matter what the title of the workshop, uh, would pe people would call them smile workshops because I'd have people go through progressive yeah. smile activation. And what I was trying to figure out is the connection between the smile and the rest of you. And it ends up that there are nervous system connections, that, you're, that, you're, that your nerves actually connect your smile with your heart. Mm, wow. And so that's a good way to put it. When you're smiling, it's touching your heart and it's pulling you together in a, in a way that is really essential. Wow. Yeah, I never heard it put that way. That's a really excellent way to put it. And, uh, and so that, and, and it seems like, you know, when, particularly in times when people are, uh, when there's so much trauma. That is, that is manifest in the world, that's obvious. And we're, we're we see more trauma on, on the news, uh, on the internet, and so on. And so we start to condition ourselves to imagine that that's really the condition of the world. But if you look at your own life, um, there's all sorts of soothing things. There's all sorts of kindness and all sorts of playfulness that's part of your life. And if you begin to um, allow that to... Um, to fill you, then when you look at these things outside, you have perspective and you're less likely to be manipulated by fear. And I have to say that in our political system, both sides use fear to manipulate, to uh, essentially blackmail uh, people into donating money to their political party. Because again, it's all about fear. Uh, you know, the, the progressives, you know, Trump, 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 and send us three dollars, and and the uh, you know the conservatives Hillary 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 send us three dollars, and so what they're doing is rather than conditioning people to be proactive for what they want to create, they create a condition where people are reactive, where the creativity, the creative part of our brain, becomes smaller, and the fight or flight mechanism becomes larger, and it's a lot easier to manipulate. Uh, populations that way. You have a book that you want to point to? Yeah, well, I want to point Yesterday, I interviewed Matt Stoller, who wrote the book Goliath, and it's a book about monopoly. And he talks yeah. about how in the 70s, our culture transitioned from people identifying themselves as civilians to being consumers. Right. And a consumer just takes stuff and processes stuff. A civilian stands up. A civilian takes responsibility. A, a, a civilian has a sense of self agency that you lose as a consumer. So I think. And would you say citizen? Would that be the better? 
that he does he use civilian or citizen? I'm curious. He said he said citizen. Yeah, yeah. I said civilian is citizen. Yeah. He's talking yeah. about citizen. Yeah, I, I screwed it up last yesterday. Good distinction. Yeah, yeah, that's a good distinction. Yeah. And 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 that's a part of co community too. I mean, in in a consumer culture, uh, people are not parts really of a community. They are in parallel to each other rather than interacting with each other and taking care of each other. Exactly. As we've moved, I mean, it's been said that we've moved from a front porch society to a backyard society. And in the backyard society, you have your privacy, you have your friends, you have the people that you choose to interact with. You're not visible from the street. And a front porch society is a lot more like this interactive community where people come together to support one another and nobody falls through the cracks. So in our urbanization and suburbanization, very few suburbs have front porches. They mainly have backyards. And so we have um, taken our privacy, and of course, same thing with, with public transit and driving in your car. Everybody loves to drive in their car because they have their own little uh, isolated um, ecosystem, or Swami would call it ego system uh, in, in their car, that they can um, allow themselves to live a life that's separate from most other people. We have the zombification of an entire generation that spends their, uh, where there's kids that are spending all their time in virtual reality, probably because real reality sucks so bad, and they're spending all their time in virtual reality. They're not even engaging in the backyard. They, if they're in the backyard, they're doing this, you know, they're, they're poking around on their yeah, well, I was going to say, you know, be between the onset of air conditioning and color TV and Netflix, uh, the, our culture has been couchified. And people don't really understand history. You know, I, uh, I, my, my cell phone stopped working the other day, so I went into the, uh, went into the AT and T store, and the young guy is looking at it and goes, "Wow." this is really an old cell phone. I said, yeah, this is the cell phones that they used in World War I. <laughs> and he, he didn't get it. <laughs> he thought, well, I'm probably telling the truth there. So um, I think that in, a, in an, a society where current events are so present, there isn't a perspective of history. Things are happening so quickly. Our attention spans are, are less. And so consequently, we're more susceptible to those consumer messages um, that essentially keep us separated than the uh, citizen messages that allow us to um, act in accord. A distinction that I came, came upon a while back is the difference between public opinion and public will. Public opinion is something designed to be manipulated. Public will is when people awaken together and decide there's enough of us and we want this. And I think that that's, uh, that's what you're talking about in your um, bottom-up revolution book because it cannot be predicted necessarily from what's happening at the top, like the Tea Party, the Occupy. And I think that there is a new um, movement brewing that uh, breaks us through the barrier between left and right and is a much more emergent look at, you know what, the entire system needs to be impeached. You know, I, I, I have conversations with conservatives and you know, there are some areas where we're going to clearly clash and disagree, but there's a lot that I can generally agree with when I'm talking to conservatives. And I think that's, we, we need to build on that really. We've, we've had divide and conquer. Um, we are uh, intentionally each side is giving a narrative that the other side sees as obviously flawed. Like, for example, let's say you identify as a progressive. You don't identify with everything that progressives are for, or people imagine that. So when people look at you as a conservative, looking at you as a progressive, they think you believe all of these things, and maybe you believe 40% of those. Same with conservatives. And so exactly. because, because of that, when push comes to shove at election time, we are voting for the lesser evil, which is nonetheless an evil. So just as surely as uh, the shadow of Donald Trump was obvious to uh, anyone who is not a conservative, um, 
the shadow of Hillary Clinton was just as vil- visible to uh, to the Trump side, and uh, certainly after Bernie was nudged out of the uh, out of the campaign. So what happened? What happened? Uh, it, the reason why 2016 was a a breakthrough, even though it was a breakdown election, is that the lesser evil approach that the Democrats have used no longer worked. Their brand has been vote for us, we're not as bad as the other guys. Wouldn't yes. you prefer positive change in very, very, very small increments to negative change in very, very, very large excrements, right? So, uh, but apparently that wasn't the case. It wasn't enough to, uh, to, to pull Hillary through. Well, I think and, there was too much excrement all around and that's what happened there. And yeah, uh, it was also a lot, of that. a lot of excrement in terms of the performance of Hillary's campaign in Michigan and Ohio and Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. They just didn't do their job. Well, and, and of course, it had to do with her smugness, her narcissism, and all of the, all of the traits that people in flyover country um, have come to despise. They, they see it as hypocritical progressives who are preaching all of this love thy neighbor stuff, but their lifestyle and ultimately their policies because Obama uh, put in more Monsanto people than, than Bush did. Oh, wait, Mo, uh, Obama's perfect. He's perfect. He's wonderful. You can't criticize Obama. There you have it. There you have it. And so what's happened on both sides is that each side has been thrown to defend their lesser evil. But wait, everybody, wait, yeah. Hillary says that there are all these people telling her that she should run again. What are your thoughts on that? Well, Swami says that he would love to see Hillary run. And in fact, he volunteers to lead the mob that chases her. <laughs> okay. Yes. I'm, I'll, I'll join in. End of conversation on that. <laughs> yeah. So you, you, we, um, we're going to need to take a, a, a brief break. And uh, then I, I'm going to ask you to talk about cosmic comic consciousness. Oh, where well, the okay. Swami would be able to do that. All right. So I'm going to pause for the video so that I can add a bumper on the audio. All right. So my guest for this show is Steve Behrman. He's also known as Swami Beyond Ananda. He's a comedian. He, he does comedy, which has been called irreverently uplifting. He's been described both as comedy disguised as wisdom and wisdom disguised as comedy. And his website is wakeuplaughing.com, where he has a blog as well. Okay, so, one, 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 mod- one moderate, modest correction. Beyond Ananda. It's an Italian name. Beyond Ananda. Beyond Ananda. Yeah. Beyond Ananda. Ananda in Sanskrit means bliss, which I didn't know. But I knew that all of the Swamis had Ananda, Yogananda, Muktananda, Satchitananda, uh, and so beyond Ananda. Uh, mm-hmm. So that, that's the name. And, and you mentioned cosmic coming consciousness. So um, I'll tell a little story. Uh, several years ago, Trudy and I were in Europe, and we met somebody who was a translator, an interpreter. And she said that, uh, something which I've known for a long time, the hardest thing to translate is a joke because a joke is often uh, idiomatic, it's often uh, cultural based, and it's very hard to have that occur in translation. So she's, the guy is giving a talk and she's uh, translating it, and he tells a joke, she translates the joke and everybody laughs. And the guy is very impressed. He comes up to her after, he says, wow, how did you get, how did you translate my joke? She said, oh, I just said, it's a joke, laugh. So I've been, I've been telling that story for years, and I recognize that that is the first precept of cosmic comic consciousness, is that if you're able to create a degree of separation from the conditions in your life with a, a humorous perspective, then you have a higher view. Levity is a higher view. You levitate. It lifts you up so that you can see things from a higher standpoint. Gravity, the grave situation of the world, brings us down. So if something is vexing to you, we're not talking about hell. We're talking about heck. 
give you an example. We're, uh, we're driving uh, on our tour and we come to a point in the road where um, there's a vehicle on fire and the cars get let through except three cars in front of us, they stop traffic. And we're there for 45 minutes or an hour while they put out the fire in this um, recreational vehicle. Fortunately, nobody was hurt, but they had to put out the fire. And so I realized hell is having your vehicle burn up. Heck is being delayed while you're safe. You're safe, but your, your plans have been burnt, blown up or something like that. So when you're in a condition that, we, that our ego tends to take poisonally, when we're either feeling attacked or we're feeling um, abandoned or any of these uh, human, human things that, that are not life-threatening but are laugh-threatening, if you adopt a perspective, it's a joke, laugh. You may find that just that little bit of pause, you may actually find a joke hidden in the picture. You may find that. So the first precept is it's a joke, laugh. Now, if you've lost a loved one or you've lost a limb or you've gotten a life-threatening diagnosis or uh, your, business, your, your house burned down, um, it takes a lot more to go, it's a joke, laugh. I'm not saying that that's where you go with it. Although, in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl uh, talked about being in a Nazi death camp during World War II. He and a fellow inmate made a pact. Every day, they would find something to laugh about. And to give you an idea of, of how this created leverage or leverage, there's actually a book called Laughter in Hell, humor and the Holocaust. And it looked at, first of all, how uh, Hitler's greatest threat were the cabaret comedians in the 1930s as he was coming to power. First thing he did was he got rid of them. The other thing that this book talks about is inside the concentration camps, how humor was used as a spiritual survival tool. And to give you an idea of the kind of leverage that that created. One of the jokes that actually circulated among the inmates involved these two Jewish guys who decide they're going to assassinate Hitler. They know Hitler's motorcade is going to pass a certain intersection at 11 in the morning and they're waiting for him. 11.15, he's not there, 11.30. When he's not there, by 11.45, one of the assassins turns to the other and says, gee, I hope nothing's happened to him. <laughs> So, so that gives you an idea of how much spiritual power you can have by, by finding the humor perspective, even in the most dire of tragedies. The second precept of cosmic comic consciousness is to lovingly laugh in your own face. This is where um, uh, the human condition and the human conditioning has to do with the ego. And of course, we need the ego. We need that separation. We, we need that, uh, that sense of self in order to make ourselves a way in the world and have independence and so on. However, when we get addicted to the ego and we imagine that that's all we are, that's where humor can come in and create a playful disruption that allows us to see differently. Uh, and if we're able to create defenselessness by laughing in our own face, Abraham Lincoln being a great example, he's in a debate, his opponent calls him two-faced. He said, hey, if I had two faces, would I be wearing this one? Disarming people. As a kid, baseball was my religion. Casey Stengel was manager of the Yankees at that point and growing up in New York. And the story about Casey Stengel was when he was a rookie, many years before I was born, the fans in New York disliked him. Every time he walked onto the field, he would get booed. One day, the fan, he walks up to bat, fans boo him. He tips his cap and a little sparrow flies out from under his cap. And everyone in the ballpark stood up and cheered. They never booed him again. So, of course, the moral is, if you're going to flip somebody the bird, make it a real bird, you see. So, Lovingly laughing in your own face invites other people to be defenseless as well. 
and it cultivates defenselessness. Third precept is find the joke hidden in the picture. And that is when there is something that is a vexing problem, particularly something that happens over and over and over again, and you're looking for a breakthrough solution. I'll give you an example. Uh, as I said earlier, my wife Trudy and I have been married 33 and a third years. And it's a wonderful relationship. And there's always these things about your partner that are, are totally endearing. And then there are the other things, the things that they do that drives you absolutely bonkers. And so Trudy is always the last one out of any gathering. And I'm ready to go home and ready to drive home. I like, I like drive home, fall asleep. I like that better than the alternative. And she's the last one out. And I get very vexed. And then I realized at one point that we have an interspecies marriage. I'm a dog and she's a cat. So I'm out there and, and I, the joke among our friends, they understand that I have to make sure if we're leaving that I keep her in front of me. If I, if I get in front of her, it's a lost cause. I have to wait. So it's, it's our anniversary a few years ago. We're going for a hike and I'm already in the car and I go, uh-oh. I'm like the dog. I got the leash in my mouth, <laughs> ready to go. And I start getting, um, start taking it poisonally. I start getting this upset, this vexation. And I say, find the joke hidden in the picture. And I couldn't do that. And then finally I got this idea. And I walk in and there's Trudy. She's a cat. She's licking her paws and she's getting ready to go. I said, Trudy, I've been waiting for you my whole life. And you're certainly worth waiting for. And at that point, we both laughed. And what would have been an argument simply became a fun story. And we went off and we had our hike and we had a totally enjoyable day. It's a very it lovable was, thing to say, actually. It was. She, she, and, and I was not prepared to say it until I forced myself to find the joke hidden in the picture. And then finally, finally, commit random acts of comedy. Anybody can do this. I've got an ebook called The Zen Comments of Harry Cohen Baba, 45 Funniest Jokes in the World and How to Tell Them. Anybody can memorize any of these jokes and in an appropriate situation, begin to use the joke. And it particularly works when somebody doesn't really understand that you're telling them a joke and you weave the joke into the already conversation. So a couple of months ago, we're, we're visiting somebody and she's talking about near-death experiences and people actually um, sending messages from the grave and all of that stuff. It was a serious conversation about that. And I said, you know, that reminds me of a story of these, um, these two fellow spiritual seekers who are very curious about that. And they made an agreement, sort of like Houdini's agreement. They made an agreement that whichever one of them died would offer the, would, would send the message to the other one after, uh, after his death. And, and so uh, after many years, Abe and Sam are their names. Abe passes away and Sam is um is meditating and he hears this very familiar voice and he goes abe is that you the voice says yes it's me he says tell me where are you what are you doing and abe says well i wake up every morning i make love all morning long have lunch have a nap make love all evening long go to sleep next day it's the same thing and sam says wow Sounds like you're in heaven. Abe says, no, actually, I'm a bull in Colorado. <laughs> now, until I did that last line, this poor lady didn't realize that I was setting her up for a joke. But then, because the gap between the expectation and the reality is so huge, the laughter is deeper. So anytime you can be with out there in public, um, and it's a form of darshan. It's a form of blessing if you're able to make people laugh in a way that's playful. We were at Whole Foods years ago when they first started making chicken pot pies. And I uh, 
call the lady behind the counter and I say, excuse me, um, the, this pot pie, exactly how much pot do you put in there? And she looked at me and she said, not nearly enough. <laughs> so when you begin to play with people, you cultivate, you cultivate their playfulness as well. And you bring their energy above the line. Every time you make somebody laugh, imagine what's happening is that they're leaving this space of fight or flight and fear, and they're being opened up to uh, a more expansive and a more evolutionary view of the world. Now, Steve, you talk about, I mean, you teach how to do comedy, right? Yeah, I do. I work with clients individually. I help people humorize their message, and I do general um, classes on how to um, bring the magic of comedy into your life, first by paying attention in a new way, and then by practice. So share us a little bit of that with us. First of all, um, understand that I grew up in a home where comedy and humor was second nature. My dad was a funny guy. Laughter was everywhere. So it was the easiest thing in the world for me to grow into that. And I was a natural. I was the kid that disrupted all the other kids. And you know that you're destined for that the first time you're in a lunchroom and you make another kid laugh so hard that milk comes out of their nose. It's a sign. <laughs> But everybody with practice can learn to do this. Trudy, my wife, grew up in a, a German family, not a lot of humor. She said, oh, yeah, it was Germanic depressive. But she learned how to cultivate humor. And there was a moment, um, an amazing healing moment that happened um, uh, right after 9-11, right after the uh, Twin Tower attacks. And Trudy and I were in an airport in Denver going to a conference that should have been canceled. And in the airport, there is just this awful tension. Uh, everybody is depressed. Everybody is traumatized. There's troops everywhere. And at some point, there's a guy who's carrying a dog in a little doggy carrying case, and he puts it down. He unzips it, and the dog pokes his head out to get some air. And Trudy walks up to the dog, and she says, loud enough for everybody to hear, excuse me, did you pack your own things today? Did any stranger give you anything? And the dog's going, <laughs> and everybody, everybody laughs. And it was a healing moment because the laughter was not at any tragedy. It was simply at this peripheral occurrence that was something that, ever, that called forth the humor in everybody. Trudy initiated that. Nobody told her to do it. In the moment, she saw that it was needed. So what I'm saying is that as we cultivate humor and as we begin to build our 10,000 hours in practice, what will happen is that these jokes, sparse fields is what Swami calls them, they will show up and magically you'll end up saying something that's the right thing, that's the funny thing. You're not trying to be funny because one of the ways to not be funny is to try. You create a lot of stress, you break down, you, you, um, you block your own creativity. When you simply allow comedy to come through you, which is what I've learned to do because I do it all the time. So it's not that I'm, uh, it's not just that I had that talent, but I've been cultivating that talent for 30 something years. And in the practice of doing that, I have confidence that jokes will show up and things that I, in ways that I'm that are surprising to me. I'll give you an example. Um, several years ago, I'm doing a presentation for Kaiser Permanente, something that they called their physician wellness program. And if you saw these doctors, you'd see what a, what a paradox that was. They were all very stressed out. And I'm looking at these these MDs, and they all seem to be from third world countries. So here I am, the Swami, doing a presentation for third world people. But the universe had a better idea. The universe did an intervention. And I'm in the midst of doing my show, and all of a sudden, over the PA, we hear, Your attention, please. Your attention, please. Will the owner of a white explorer, license number BK3, 
1-800-450-4450. Please move your vehicle. You're blocking traffic. The Swami looks up at the PA, looks at these third world people. He says, you know, I've always thought that most of the problems in this world have been caused by white explorers. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> totally unintentional. I'd never thought of that before. But in the moment when you're allowing yourself to be in the flow of creativity, which is all humor is, all it is, um, something like that can happen. If I was trying to be funny, I would have shut myself down and it wouldn't have worked. So do you have like a, 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 like a humor or a comedy set of beliefs? Set of beliefs. Um, well, I, as I said, I think that it's a joke laugh is a good fundamental place to begin. Um, and the first place to laugh is at ourselves. Uh, a friend of mine was in real estate, this is like 35, 40 years ago. He just started out and he was involved in this investment. He found that his partner went bankrupt and my friend lost $90,000. He was not amused. So he goes into the men's room to just kind of collect himself. He looks in the mirror. He looks at his face. And the only thing that he could do was to mock himself and go, ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha, ha. And he did that till he actually laughed. And in the laughter came this release. He left the men's room, took his wife out to lunch, and never looked back on that situation again. So when we make that choice to um, lovingly laugh at the situation, whatever it is, and recognize that life moves on, that we can make a choice to make our, that the negative turning point in my life. I, and my life was fine until that happened. Niagara Falls, slowly I turn, step by, you know, that, that old routine. And it activates that reactivity that doesn't have to be activated. And any time uh, I, I was doing my humor workshop and one of the people uh, in the workshop was a therapist and he said, when I first began my practice, one of my first clients was a young woman who had been sexually molested by her grandfather. And he said, I realized that this is such a delicate situation. I had to walk on eggshells and be very careful not to do or say anything that would be offensive. And he asked her an innocent question. When did your grandfather molest you? And she said, before he died. And there was something about that that he found very funny. Who wants to be molested by a poltergeist, right? And he started laughing and he couldn't stop. And the girl started laughing and she couldn't stop and they both laughed. And she laughed until she cried and it wasn't until after the tears that she was able to look at that situation and talk about it. So when we recognize that emotion is energy in motion, that anything that removes the blocks of energy, whether it's laughter, tears, sneezing, shaking, raging, all of these things that release that energy um, and allow it to move through us, it's at that point that we can actually glean some insight. We can find it, once you've laughed in your own face, you can find a joke hidden in a picture, and then you can be of use to other people as you commit random acts of comedy and bring the magic of love and laughter um, to the outer net from the internet. Can you give us a little flavor of your thinking about peace? About peace. Uh, well, of course, uh, the Swami's thinking on peace is that we will know that world peace is at hand when all of the peace groups get along with each other. And what it is, is that um, uh, what we call peace is really a healing of the human condition. Uh, you know, Bucky Fuller wrote a book 50 years ago called Utopia or Oblivion. And in the title, that essentially is the thesis of the book. It's that unless we're willing to embrace this concept of heaven on earth, we will have hell on earth. And heaven on earth doesn't necessarily mean no problems. It means better problems, having 
better problems. Instead of having the problem, I'm starving and I have nothing to eat, having the problem, God, I can't decide whether I want to eat this delicious food or that delicious food. Um, have, instead of having the problem, how do we prevent these children from becoming criminals? Having the problem, I wonder how we can create living and learning environments for children where every child is known and their genius is brought forth in the context of community. And because we've lived under this lowest common dominator meme, um, we have been traumatized internally and all of us have some form of post-traumatic stress disorder. Except for psychics, they have pre-traumatic stress disorder. That's a little different. So we're all suffering from some kind of trauma. So the way that we bring peace about is we, first of all, Bruce and I in Spontaneous Evolution came up with a three-step program, which is uh, mathematically proven to work four times faster than 12-step. And the three steps are evolutionary awareness, evolutionary intention, and evolutionary practice. So first of all, the awareness that this chaos that we see around us is a lot like being in the chrysalis, where the caterpillar is deconstructing and the new imaginal cells of this butterfly organism are, uh, as you would say, from the bottom up, beginning to recognize one another and communicate. This is happening, but it's not reported on mainstream news. It's the most dangerous thing for mainstream news to even imagine that this awakening has taken place because they want to keep us in the dueling dualities and polarities that we exist in right now. And so um, recognizing that every time there's a conversation like this and people watch the conversation and get something from it and continue the conversation in their communities, we are coalescing this new imaginal cell of the butterfly organism that is going to emerge into a butterfly. So first of all, having that awareness, we're in this process. There's no guarantees. Evolution is not a guarantee. There have been failed species for, for many, over many universes over a uh, timeless time, and we may be one of them. However, uh, as Bruce Lipton says now, conscious evolution, our alternative to mass extinction, make the choice. And that's where the intention comes in. Every day I'm going to live my life as if we are in this chrysalis and we're bringing about this new organism where we recognize that we're all cells in the same body. So the issue of peace becomes, becomes a, a mood issue because you're saying, oh, well, war is autoimmune disease. Why would we be killing other healthy cells? Why can't we find ways of actually cooperating together? And then we're able, as healthy cells emerging, uniting, unite and prevail rather than divide and conquer, we're able to isolate the sociopathogens in the body politic. We need the sociopathogens to, you know, to make sure that we have an immune system, to make sure that we have something to um, push up against. You can't have love without the absence of love. One of the things that makes love so beautiful is when we notice the absence of love. And right now we have a political administration that is the absence of love. It is the epitome of the absence of love. If we ever needed to see that, and I call it America's balloon karma payment because we're recognizing the absence of love in our own history, both in terms of slavery and genocide of native peoples, and then also in our lifetimes in the last 70 or so years after World War II, recognizing that the secret um, government and so on, uh, the real deep state, not the entrenched bureaucrats, but you know the forces that are um, unchecked and unbalanced, have created such a toxic condition in this country and such a distortion through the Kennedy assassinations, the King assassinations, 9-11 and other perpetrations, that this PTSD that we're suffering from as a, as a population has created such a level of dysfunction that we elected Donald Trump president. That's where I'm looking at that. So in looking at that absence of love, we are recognizing that the only way to overgrow this is not by resisting 
because I mean, resisting Trump is irresistible. Yeah, but that's not how we're going to do it. We're going to do it by overgrowing and having a goal and intention, uh, an evolutionary intention that moves us way past that. So having genuine peace where there's peace and justice, there's peace and thrival for all, there's the golden rule overruling the rule of gold is a necessary factor in our evolution. If we are going to make it, if we are going to survive as a civilization and as a species, we have to up level to where we're cells in the same body, we're working together in competition in the original Greek sense, which meant striving together. We're striving together, we're not fighting each other. We're using each other to evoke our personal best. And that's how we're gonna do it if we are to do it. Okay, and that well, is, we've only got a couple minutes left. Yeah. And I wanna, and I know you, you, you took the time and you read my book. And yeah. I just wanted to see if you've got any thoughts about bottom up in terms of the way you think about things. It was a, uh, having read your book, uh, it really is a tremendous affirmation to how evolution takes place. Because again, um, there's so many brilliant geniuses with great ideas that they want to impose on the top down. None of those great ideas is going to happen in the way that they think it is. However, from the bottom up, as people begin to, uh, first of all, make the connection themselves with whatever they call the ineffable, uh, that creates an individual that has the seeds for being truly free. Then they can become, they're interdependent. Then they become independent, where they are an entity that is a sovereign soul proprietor, S-O-U-L, ready to engage with others and be interdependent. But it has to begin with the individual awakening. The individual awakens, the individual sets an intention, and then from the bottom up, connects and, uh, with other individuals, and they find that there is an understanding that emerges naturally. One final thing, the native peoples, when they, when they sit in their sacred circle, uh, I heard one native elder put it, we talk and talk and talk and talk until there's nothing left but the obvious truth. The obvious truth emerges from that circle of people sitting together in inquiry without having um, a overarching ideology or opinion. Another great teacher, Caroline Casey says, believe nothing, entertain possibilities. So as we believe nothing, entertain possibilities, we allow this new way to emerge and we, we become part of something that is so magical and so surprising that it's better than anything that we can design from the top down. Are there bottom-up aspects of comedy? Um, bottom-up aspects of comedy has to do with um, engaging with people as an audience, um, noticing what they're bringing forth. I find that when, I'm, when I allow myself to, quote unquote, be with an audience, I find that without rehearsal, I naturally am bringing out things that they want to hear. It's happening invisibly by magic because I'm in that field where all of these individuals together are creating a collective field. I allow that to happen and my comedy responds to not just the questions that people ask, but the, un the unspoken in that room. And you do improv, which I think is another kind of bottom up uh, aspect of comedy where you're responding to people's requests to and, and questions really. You're totally in the moment. And that's what, that's what the, bottom, the bottom up has to be. What is required is being present because there's no design. Um, so many times when we've had an experience before, uh, we've been to this beautiful, beautiful restaurant many, many times. And then it's hard to determine, am I here now or am I remembering the times that I was here before? So novelty is an aspect of humor novelty you're always looking for novelty you're always looking for a new way of seeing things a new way emerging 
And that new way, since it hasn't been done before, will emerge from the, uh, the zeitgeist of whatever that particular audience is, if you're, in, if you're in tune with that. And that's how I try to tune myself. And that's where we need to wrap up, I think. Uh, Steve, thanks so much for being on the show. My guest for this show has been Steve Behrman, also known as Swami Beyond Ananda, Beyond Dananda. <laughs> and his website is wakeuplaughing.com. Thanks so much for being on the show. Steve. Thanks, Rob, for doing what you do.